Hello and welcome to the tenth in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm going to be talking about the origin of the human species, the last few million years in which hominids have arisen on the earth and evolved into our present form. As ever, I'm basing my talk today on the slide presentations of the infamous young earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means I'm going to respond to points raised in his slides, so I won't cover all of this topic by any means, just the bits that are relevant to the creationist claims. Lots of these arguments are dealt with in the wonderful archive on talkorigins.org. Please search their extremely detailed site and read their much more thorough rebuttals of these claims. You can find many of the arguments that I've used here on that site. However, I've added in a few extra bits to bring the coverage up to date. So let's get started. The evidence for intermediate species of hominid between our last common ancestor with the chimpanzees and modern humans is always a hot topic when debating creationists. To an untrained eye, there might not look like an overwhelming amount of data, but to a trained eye, what we have gives us a huge amount of information. The history of human evolution is fairly well understood. There are holes in the story that are gradually being filled in, though the picture overall is largely complete. The details are likely to be very specialised, and I would advise against debating the specifics of this area unless you know what you're talking about. However, it's worth learning the general information and a few common creationist claims that are easily disprovable. The order of hominid evolution is something like that shown on this page, with some uncertainties as noted. A brief glance at Wikipedia currently, that is May 2011, shows a list of the remains of around 87 separate fossil finds, some including remains from many individuals, dated between 100,000 and 4 million years old. The number of finds increases to 127 when you consider the whole range of human evolution discussed on this slide, and the collection is growing rapidly. Currently much of the globe has not been extensively searched for fossils, so the number of finds is likely to improve massively in future. This is a very brief overview of the current state of play with our evolutionary lineage, and it all begins with a creature known as Sahelanthropus chidensis, which was a primate which lived around 7 million years ago, known from a fossilised skull discovered in Chad, hence the name, between 2001 and 2002. And the amazing thing about this creature is that it predates the split between the lineage of humans and chimpanzees, which means that this may well be an ancestor that we have in common. We move on to Ororin tugensis, which was discovered in Kenya in 2000. We have 20 fossil pieces of this species, which was probably another ancestor of Homo sapiens, and dates from around the time that the human and chimpanzee lineages were actually splitting. After that we come to Ardipithecus, a genus containing two species, of which the important one is Ardipithecus ramidus. We have several specimens of this species, including one nearly complete skeleton unearthed in Ethiopia in 2009. Which brings us to the Australopithecines, the first genus with some really recognisably human characteristics. Of this genus, we have around 17 collections of fossils from a range of individuals, the most famous of which is Lucy, which is an example of a female Australopithecus afarensis, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. This partial skeleton, consisting of hundreds of bone fragments, shows a bipedal hominid around 1.1 metres tall, with human-like pelvis and legs, indicating that Lucy walked upright. She lived around 3.2 million years ago. Now we move well into more recognisably human species. Kenyanthropus, no prizes for guessing, is a species from Kenya, consisting only of a number of skull and teeth fragments. It dates from around the same age as a skeleton known as Lucy, and was probably a direct precursor of Paranthropus, a far more widely represented genus of which we have 11 fossil collections, between around 2.5 and 1.4 million years old. After which we're definitely into the age of our own genus, Homo, with the earliest Homo erectus and Homo habilis dating from around 2 million years ago, and then proceeding through Homo ergaster and various others right up to the present day. Of course, in this list I've omitted a load of side species which aren't our direct ancestors, but which still form a part of the story of the evolutionary history of the hominid lineage. But this is just a quick overview after all. Let's move on. Now that I've given a brief overview of the fossil finds associated with the history of the human species, I'm going to cover a few sidelines that Hovind brings up to attempt to discredit the entire science. And, as ever, he does it by anomaly hunting, by finding examples that appear to look dodgy, and then proceeds to assert that the rest of the entire science of paleontology is as dodgy as these few individual finds. In fact, the cases I'll cover here are examples of exactly why Hovind is wrong, and why the scientific viewpoint is so strong. Because science is very good at correcting itself, so whenever mistakes happen or frauds attempt to divert the course of scientific progress, the anomaly is rarely widely believed, 
especially if it doesn't fit in with the existing scientific models, and it's always called out by scientists themselves as part of the error-correcting nature of the scientific process. Nebraska man is such an example. A single human-like tooth was discovered in 1922, which some scientists claim showed ape-like characteristics. Some were, of course, more excited by the find than others, with the majority not accepting the tooth as being from a hominid. Despite allegations that the tooth was used as evidence at the Scopes trial, this was not in fact the case. This trial, legendary in creationism circles and famously depicted in the rather enjoyable film Inherit the Wind, formed the first high-profile trial of creationism against evolution. The film is definitely worth watching if you haven't already done so. As it turns out, the tooth was not from a hominid at all, but was from a peccary, a small pig-like animal. The insinuation from Hovind is that this somehow shows that all evidence for the ancestry of our species is flawed, though frankly I find that view puzzling. One single tooth, thought by many not to be authentic even at the time, which was never properly tested and was not subjected to any of the vast array of tests that have been developed in the 90 years since, does not in any way give me cause for concern. Quite why Hovind thinks that his listeners would be swayed by such a tenuous assault confuses me. Piltdown Man is perhaps a more notorious case of mistaken identity, referring to a hoax perpetrated at the beginning of the 20th century, a hundred years ago, a fact which already disqualifies it from any relevance to modern science whatsoever, but let's cover it briefly. The Piltdown Man was a skull discovered in East Sussex, Britain, around 1912. It was thought by some to be an example of an early modern hominid, though never really fitted in with any of the species known at the time, and many were sceptical about its origins. Nevertheless, it wasn't exposed as a hoax until 1953, when a team of scientists showed conclusively that it was composed of a medieval human skull and an orangutan jaw with fossil teeth from a chimpanzee. Nobody knows who the forger was, and we probably never will, but Piltdown Man remains as one of the most famous hoaxes in the history of science, partly due to the disproportionate media interest it obtained. Nowadays, of course, the hoax would not have lasted a week, as the carbon-14 dating of the components would have immediately betrayed their origins, and besides, the skull would not fit in with any of our existing fossil collections. This is another example of a hoax which was discovered and exposed by scientists themselves, showing just how good the error-correcting nature of science actually is. Many of the species that I've been covering so far may appear very unfamiliar to you, but I'm willing to bet that you've heard of the Neanderthals. The name comes from the Neander Valley in Germany, in Old German Neanderthal, where the first specimens were discovered. Neanderthals are thought to be a cousin species to our own, probably not our direct ancestors, but certainly existing at the same time as modern Homo sapiens, from around 130,000 years ago, finally dying out around 30,000 years ago. Neanderthals were an advanced species, making stone tools like our own ancestors, and possessing a brain at least as large as our own, possibly larger. They were also physically powerful, probably more so than our own species. One possible theory is that the Neanderthals shared a common ancestor with Homo sapiens in Homo rhodesiensis, a species that arose around a million years ago in Africa, and which was known to still be in existence 300,000 years ago, though there is still some considerable debate. Of course, this is all nonsense to Hovind, who confidently proposes his own half-baked ideas to explain the existence of Neanderthal fossils. He neatly sidesteps the fact that the fossils are being comprehensively dated, of course. Could they not just be humans with a certain disease, he asks? For example, rickets. This is a vitamin D deficiency, which does occasionally cause some facial disfigurement, but it also causes bone weakness, which we don't see in the Neanderthal fossils. Also, you have the large size and solid build to explain away against this proposal. Well, what if Neanderthals were just really old humans? Again, you don't see the age-related degeneration in the bones we have, and besides, we have the remains of infant Neanderthals with exactly the same features. Oh, and I should have mentioned, we have Neanderthal DNA too, and it's substantially different from human DNA. It's way more different from our DNA than any other human being on the planet today. All of this adds up to a pretty comprehensive proof that Neanderthals are a separate species, or perhaps a subspecies in the hominid lineage, closely linked to our own. 